Now that we've considered some factors that influence subsistence around the world, let's review the different subsistence patterns that have existed in history and which continue to exist today. The two categories of subsistence, remember, are foraging, we'll discuss that in a moment, and production, foods that are produced, which doesn't necessarily mean food made in a factory or something like that. No, production really refers to how we control the growth of the foods we eat, both plants and animals, which are all domesticated. If you're talking about, let's say, wild plants or animals, then it's not production, that's foraging. That's like the San people of Botswana, who gather insects and fruits along with ostrich eggs for their diet. So with production, we raise or grow domestic plants and animals, and that's a big deal. You see, the majority of people around the world today subsist on produced foods. Production provides a potentially abundant source of food, although not all foods are produced alike. Certainly, the most common form of food production is cultivation, which is defined as the labor or effort you put into tilling the land and growing your crops. However, the other form of food production is pastoralism. Pastoralism is the breeding and managing of herds of tame grazing animals such as goats, sheep, and cattle. Hunting wild animals for food is definitely not pastoralism. Again, that would be foraging. Pastoralists raise and slaughter their own animals for food, as well as to meet a variety of other needs. You see what I mean? Let's take a look at a few examples of pastoralist cultures. Traditionally, pastoralists were nomadic, moving around. In other words, they were compelled to migrate from season to season in order to provide their animals with sufficient grazing lands. Remaining in one place was simply unfeasible, since the herds would fairly quickly consume all the vegetation the land could provide. Nomadic pastoralists had to keep moving to keep their animals alive. There are still a number of nomadic pastoralist cultures in the world today, including the Nuer cattle herders of Sudan, the Nanette reindeer herders of Siberia, and the Rabadi goat herders of India. For instance, Nuer cattle herders in southern Sudan remain sedentary during the wet season while they grow their crops, but they become nomadic again, moving from place to place during the dry season when it becomes more difficult to find enough food for the cattle. This combination of dry season pastoralism and wet season cultivation has become fairly common among pastoralists. Another type of pastoralism is known as sedentary pastoralism or pastoral farming. Unlike nomadic pastoralists, Sedentary pastoralists, or let's say ranchers of industrial nations, such as cattle ranchers in the United States and Brazil, or sheep herders in Ireland and Australia, tend to remain in one location with limited grazing lands. They're usually assisted by feed brought in from outside so that many farmed animals needn't move from place to place to find food. In fact, some farmed animals barely move at all, such as cattle raised and slaughtered young to be sold as tender veal, or young sheep sold as lamb. Their growth may be further assisted by hormones and specialized breeding for greater bulk achieved at a faster pace than animals raised by nomadic pastoralists. Apart from pastoralism, however, the far more prevalent form of food production is cultivation of which there are also two types, horticulture and intensive agriculture. Horticulturalism is a simple, more limited form of agriculture. Horticulturalists tend to be small communities who cultivate small plots of land, producing just enough food. Any given plot will be farmed for only a year or two, after which 
they abandon it for another plot of land where the nutrients are richer. A variety of crops are usually grown together, thus ensuring that some crops will always survive, you know, even if one or two crops are attacked by pests. Horticulture tends to be found in areas with distinct rainy seasons, and so the crops are worked with simple hand tools without extensive irrigation, thus requiring less social organization to tend the crops. The end result furnishes the horticulturalists with sufficient food to survive and perhaps to trade with outsiders, but little or no surplus to store for later consumption. A fairly common form of horticulturalism is known as slash and burn, or Swidden farming. With Swidden farming, the land is prepared for planting by first slashing or cutting down existing vegetation. Whatever plants and trees might be growing there, you cut them down and then you burn them, which produces a fresh top soil rich in nutrients which are necessary for the growing season. However, by the end of the season, the nutrients have been depleted, and typically the Sweden farmer must now move on to a new plot of land. So long as this technique is employed by smaller communities with low population density and adequate amounts of land for purposes of rotation, then Sweden farming can be highly effective as it is for the Trobrain Islanders, for instance, who use horticulture for their yam farms. Finally, unlike horticulture, intensive agriculture involves the use of complex systems of irrigation, natural or artificial fertilizers, and animal or fuel-propelled plows, enabling much larger tracts of land to be cultivated for a much larger population as well as providing surplus food for storage and for trade and other commercial purposes. Although this form of agriculture is often associated with industrial developed nations, a number of indigenous peoples also employ this method, including the Aymara Indians of Peru and Bolivia, who grow huge quantities of potatoes. Moreover, intensive agriculture even predates history, as prehistoric ancient peoples such as the Egyptians practiced it as well. Egyptians grew abundant crops, for instance, wheat and barley.